because we are co-creators and the generators of this world that we see, you have to actually elevate the power of every word you say, and every word is a prayer. And that is what my work has taught me as a medical intuitive. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted answers from the divine and to discover the power of prayer, then do we have the Intimate Conversations with the Divine show for you. Today I'll be talking with Carolyn Mace, five-time New York Times best-selling author, mystic healer, the co-founder of CMED, and the author of an incredibly heart-open, vulnerable, and revealing important book on prayer, Intimate Conversations with the Divine. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about the power of prayer, guidance, and grace. That, plus we'll talk about knives and handles, wolves and caves, the princess and the pea, Teresa of Avita, Saint Teresa and daughter follow me, entering the castle, why nothing is all there is, what on earth is a psychic pandemic, and what in the world the sweetness of Friday afternoons has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Carolyn. Are you ready to shine? Boy, are you enthusiastic. Yes. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> what a runway to lift off. Hello. <laughs> very, very cool. So on that note, going up from that high note to maybe something else, before we dive right into things, what do you feel is going on with the world today? Oh, well, okay. Let's start out small. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just my opinion on things, so let's be clear about that. Um, everybody has their view, but I, I take the long view. I take a historic view, an archetypal view. I don't just – it's the same way as doing a reading on somebody, Michael. If I said, if you came to me for your health and I was going to do an evaluation on you, I would require – in order to do something effective for you and helpful, I would need a sense of your history mm -hmm. and I would need a sense of your archetypal patterns. I would need a sense of where you came from and what made you what you are. I would need a sense of the mythic beliefs you have and where they were colliding with each other. I would need to know what you did not have faith in, that you were striving to have faith in. I, I would need to know what you about and what fears were driving you, because that's where the power is in you. I would need to know what your power symbols were, because that that's the underlying fear currents that actually speak to you the most, what Teresa of Avila would call your reptiles. Yes. So I would need all of that to present to you any kind of portrait of a fuller understanding of your psychic field. I would need to know how well you understood your own capacity to co-create your reality, what you blamed others for in your life. And how you saw yourself as a victim or somebody who actually does participate in taking accountability for yourself. Not responsibility, but accountability. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at what's happening today, I don't look at it just from this moment, but rather from um, the in the momentum that has been created since we entered the nuclear age. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, we have been on a path of different um, archetypal ingredients that have never existed before in the history of humanity. We've had this idea that we co-create reality. Mm -hmm. That was not a thought form that was an active ingredient in the human condition prior to entering the nuclear age. We have this passion to individuate. That was never present. We have this dictate of holism to become whole that we've applied to our nutrition. Yeah. But in fact, 
It is a cosmic dictate to head in the direction of becoming a global community. That is something that <clears throat> we are driven toward cosmically, but are fighting individually. Yeah. We don't want that, but we have to go in that direction. So we're going in that direction through technology, mm -hmm. but individually, we were born and raised in generations of sovereign nations. So it's very difficult. And that's part, but the, we don't have problems anymore. We have predicaments, predicaments that are driving us to have to cooperate together, environmental ones. And again, the challenges and predicaments facing us are driving us to collective solutions that cannot be accommodated by treaties and papers, but by the, by the shifting of human behavior. So we have been for decades anticipating all kinds of catastrophic events. And they're in our movies, they have been in our dialogues, they've been in our atmosphere. So is it, and even movies about pandemics and epidemic, epidemics and, and invasions and all kinds of things. So is it really surprising to us that something like that has happened? So how do I see it? Yes. I see it as this is right on course. We've been ex we've been anticipating some kind of something that would be a catapult, a a a catalyst rather mm -hmm. that would shift our way of thinking and this one thank heavens has the collective message you have to heal. And it wasn't sp sparked by a bomb or a political activist or some kind of malicious intent, though someone might want to put that thought forward. Um, and if it was a laboratory experiment gone bad, then it's all of our faults for even creating a society that would participate mm -hmm. in the creation of biological weaponry. So all of that, to me, signals that the time has come for us to work together toward healing, like it or not. From the me to the we. In fact, you call this a synchronistic perfect storm for social change. Our new logo for our show is a phoenix rising. What does the <laughs> phoenix, I love synchronicities, Carolyn. What does the phoenix mean to you during this time? Well, we, we live in Colorado. We, my wife and I have had three miscarriages in the year and a, last year and a half. We've had two fires come to within a mile and a half of the house and ash falling out of the sky. And I can't help but notice the symbolism in this. Did you know I just finished uh, that I'm doing a series called Phoenix Rising? I just learned that as I was preparing for this and I'm going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, it's my online series for this year. And in fact, while we're talking, I, I am finishing scripting my fourth program. So I did the Phoenix Rising mm -hmm. because that is the symbol of the organic cycle of life. And what I wanted to introduce was yet another um cosmic ingredient that I think is part of what's happening, which is the, I believe the, we're in the denouement of the Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. the end of the half God, half man religion that is, you know, coming to a close yep. and that it's the beginning of an or divine organics is what I call it where we where we recognize that God is law and that we have a um, bio spiritual ecological theology. What does that mean? Well, that the the laws that govern nature are the same laws that govern our bio spiritual physiology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they are essentially the laws of nature. All is one. The law of balance governs you. 
the law of uh, all the laws that you li- that we're learning to live by in terms of our health are the exact laws on the macro that nature lives by. We are a micro earth. And as we attend to our micro earth, we are in fact, what is in one is in the whole, participating in all life breathes together, attending to the macro earth. And it is one huge bio-spiritual life system, an integrated life system. It's not enough to recycle and then be psychically abusive. I mean, what, what are you accomplishing? You know, and to be a racist, to be a misogynist, to be to to be a psychic criminal. You know, it's not enough. I mean, you're in the hell with your recycling. And what matters is what you're generating in the laws of co-creation. People, you just can't apply the laws of co-creation to what you want. It's to who you are and how you are with others. And that you have to understand that every because we are co-creators and the generators of this world that we see, you have to actually elevate the power of every word you say. And every word is a prayer. And that is what my work has taught me as a medical intuitive, that for all my studies in theology, which have been extensive, it was my work as a medical intuitive which eventually led to my wondering why people don't heal to how can healing be, um, how can I help people heal to finally wondering about miracles to the, to the mystical level of healing that I finally recognized we are participants in what, is created, but not at that pedestrian level of what of getting what I want, but rather co-creation is such a high mystical calling and such a high mystical art mm-hmm. that it was that realization that caused the mystics to say, oh my God, I surrender my power back to you. Tell me what you want me to do with this gift of life you've given me. They didn't surrender out of weakness, like, oh, I'm so weak, take this life from me. It was, oh my God, you've given me so much, direct me with it. Woohoo! That is my motto right now as we're going through this. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. On that plus, note, oh, go for it. Plus direct me. Yes. What do you me to do. I'll be your hands in the world. I'll be this. But in surrendering, but in surrendering, that's when you really need to pray for, talk to me. What do you want? I mean, you have to understand what surrender is. I mean, surrender is a high mystical prayer. Mm. It's what do you want of me? What do you want of me? And from that point on, every day is this is what you want of me. I'll attend to this person. I'll attend to this person. I'll attend to this task. And from that point on, every task, no task is too small. No task is too unclean. Everything becomes something that is attached to the greater whole and has profound significance. I like to call it everything is ceremony. Everything is sacred. I want to go back to a sacred day in your life. An Mm -hmm. October Friday afternoon, (laughs) sweet Friday (laughs) afternoon, 15 or so years ago. Oh, yeah. That was the day everything changed. I went, it was a gorgeous day. I mean, it was an absolutely spectacular day. It was one of those days. And this is how heaven just sweeps in and, and, and pulls the rug out from under you. And it's, it's always, there's heaven's so clever. It was one of those days where I was feeling so good in my skin. You know, I was feeling like what a great life I have. And I, I was feeling healthy and happy. And I was in my little townhouse and everything seemed so it was and I love Fridays I love Fridays my favorite day of the week I love Fridays and I was looking out the window thinking what a lovely Friday afternoon it was the perfect temperature and the perfect Friday and I was feeling perfect I love that word 
Yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of my perfectness comes this thought form, this message that it was, and I knew because it was so completely uninvited and so crushing to my perfectness. And it said, you don't have a prayer life. And it was so juxtaposition to everything. And it hit me and it shattered everything. It shattered my perfect, my perfectness. It just went right to my gut. And I stood there and I thought, oh my God. And I knew, I knew, Michael, in the way that I know those things, that I'd just been shot. I just had a messenger. I just had a delivery. Mm -hmm. And a sacred FedEx, you know, just kind of, and I did, I, I, it was so full on that I started talking to, I said, I started saying, wait a minute, well, but I teach and I read and I do all of this. And I tried it. I presented an argument of compensation. Look what I do. Look at the, da, 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 da. And then I realized it was of no use. I had been given a dictate. You start praying now. And that meant, as I knew, that I would need a prayer life. That it wasn't just about that whatever was ahead of me would require a prayer life. So as I stood there in that second, I absolutely knew that everything I had lived to that moment was over with. Mm -hmm. Gone. That the electricity that was required to run my life and all those events was going to be shut off. And that like the holy mojo was going to be shut off from that. Yeah. And that whatever was ahead of me, though I didn't know, was going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. And it would require a prayer life because I was going to, about to go into an unknown part of my life. And I, and, and I had a, I was, I, I was not in any way terrified. I was a bit unnerved. And at the same time, I was absolutely intrigued because I thought, do, do I matter so much that you would pay a, send a messenger? That you would send a messenger to tell me, we're going to change your life now. We need, we, we need you to do something else. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, no, because I know what this means. I mean, oh, man, this is going to be rough going. It might be rough going. It doesn't have to be rough going, but it could get rough going. And then I thought, wow, I mean, I really heard from heaven today. And then I thought, oh, no. So I went into this kind of because because I know, oh, this is just going to be just, you know, this could get this could get really rough. And then I thought, wow. And then, oh, no. And so I went into this. And then ultimately. I just walked away. And. You kind of shelve it because in the moment, you're, the, the rest of you starts taking over because you look around and nothing in your life, in your, 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 your house has changed. It's not like your furniture starts moving. It, you, the, the ordinariness of your life just keeps going. But then what I noticed was, and this is how heaven works, I lost the appetite for my life the life I'd been living. They turned off my appetite. I lost the enthusiasm for what I was teaching. I lost the, and I, and <laughs> while I was in the classroom teaching a subject I taught for years that I just loved sacred contracts while I was teaching it, I realized in the middle of a lecture and I'm such a good teacher. I am such a, I'm a fabulous teacher. I realized my fabulousness was at half stamina and I'm never at half stamina. I'm never at half stamina. I'm always at full, all six burners are always on. Right. And 
I realized I couldn't fire up. And that's where my assistance from the divine always comes in. I turn on three burners, they turn on three burners, and then we have a show, right? And I thought, where are they? Where's my help? And I thought, oh my God, they've turned off the mojo. I'm on my own. I'm on my own. Scary. And, and scary. You know, you can't explain to any ordinary, to the ordinary world, what the extraordinary world is like when you have a rapport with it. And you've relied on that rapport consciously, not unconsciously, but consciously when it has been your conscious, constant companion since you were a child, Mm -hmm. that that you've gotten spoiled, that you've gotten absolutely spoiled, that for you, meaning me, Mm -hmm. the idea of not sensing that is my idea of a horror show. And that I can't function in this life without my sense of that. I can't function. And it, that's, what ter- that's what will cause me to have a panic attack if I ever have a panic attack, which I've never had. But if I did, yeah. it would be because I've lost that wiring. And, and so... I thought, well, aren't you clever? And then I had to, what I realized unconsciously into conscious was that I was developing an interest in something I never had an interest in, which was healing. And that's how the mystical chapter of my life opened up. It's fascinating to me because you are our last interview in this studio. And we are, geez, 1,400 and some odd shows in. And we have gotten a calling to go out on the road in an RV. No more house, no more studio. We're going out. And it is gripping scary and beautiful. We know we're called. We have no idea what's going to happen. And, and when I teach... The words are flowing to me. I can't even imagine if if in a moment the words stopped, I would be a ship sunk. And so where you have gone, but this bridge has taken you, I believe, to some place, some place mystical, into the power of prayer, into the power of grace, into teaching at a level I bet you didn't even imagine you could be teaching at. I, if someone had said to me, you're going to teach people to pray or not teach them to pray, because that's not right, but inspire them perhaps to get back to prayer, to the power of prayer, to trust in that again, to trust in that again. Honestly, I would have thought that was insane, but that's how heaven works. That's how heaven works. And I would have thought they were out of their minds because it, first of all, there's few things in life as personal as prayer, sex, and your bank account. I mean, there it is, right? And, 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 and politics, which is why, you know, people don't, it's the source of arguments. Don't go there. Don't go there with my personal life. Don't ask me about politics. You want to start a, a you know, argument? Talk about God, politics, and sex, right? You okay. You went there. In yeah. intimate conversations with the divine, you put it out there. Right. And I, and I, for years, for years, thought I am so not interested in engaging with people in their issues about God. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in listening to people tell me how despicable Catholic priests are and and what and, and, and what I realized through the years is how people can tell me with absolute conviction what they don't have faith in, but they have 
they can't with that same conviction mm -hmm. tell me what they do have faith in. And it was from that that I realized that people, when you don't, when you, when your faith mechanism is, is awry, then it's difficult for you to have faith in yourself yeah. and consequently in others and, and, in, and giving your own word doesn't, you don't trust that anyone's going to keep their word to you. Mm -hmm. It's hard for you to build bridges of faith in people. And if our society doesn't reflect the consequences of a ongoing collective faith crisis, I don't know what we're looking at. So let's go from there and let's talk about the power of prayer and grace. What's the importance of prayer to you now, and how often are you in prayer? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, let's start with what's the importance of prayer? Um, what is prayer? Who are you talking to? Well, I started out as a, as a baby Catholic with this idea that there's an off-planet God that looks like a man. Okay. So that was my image. Yeah. And everybody who grows up in a tradition, regardless of the tradition, because you're a child, you're given an image, a myth yes. to grow up in because it has to be structured. You know, a, a child's not capable of understanding a cosmic truth of high order, right? Eventually, through my, through my own work, through my own experience, through, you know, what a mystical life is about, is about the constant breakdown and breakthrough of what cannot be true, mm -hmm. then what is. So, Eventually, as I worked through our, through what is healing, I started to ask, how do people heal? And, and I asked through learning the bio-spiritual theology, what runs us? And one of the laws is what is in one is in the whole. Holism. Mm -hmm. That's a bio-spiritual. If you divide your body, the illness will conquer it but health won't. And by that same token, that means that any thought you have in your body that encourages division is toxic. So then I thought, well, that means any religion that teaches separatism, its time has come to be retired. So it does not mean that those religions have nothing of value to offer. But you have to look to their mystical traditions yeah. for their jewels. And there in Judaism and in Islam and in Christianity and in Buddhism, you find that, and in Pythagoras and in Plato, you find that they are all teaching law, mystical law. They're all, all about law. And that's what they're teaching. They don't teach behavior. They teach cosmic law. Jesus was the teaching, teacher of cosmic law. Um, the, 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 the commandments, the, the Buddha, the, the laws, it was all the Tao. They're all laws. Okay. So from that, you eventually, I developed the, the belief and the realization that the nature of God is law and that the whole of creation is the divine. Uh, I want to go back yeah. to every breath, but as a law, as an example, I would believe you would say that every religion has something that would say, for instance, as you sow, so shall you reap. Reap the law of karma. What goes around comes around. Absolutely. Absolutely. What you do to one, you do to everyone. You do to yourself. What is in one is in the whole. Think about that. 
that is as true for your biology. If I contaminate one cell in your body, I've in fact contaminated your whole body. What is in one is in the whole. Our micro is our macro. Our macro is our micro. Just because we can't see these cosmic truths doesn't mean they are not in fact the the, the running mechanism of the show behind the scenes. And that is the nature of God in all things, including the phoenix that promises that, look, you will fall from the ashes. Things in your life, a belief will fall from the ashes only to rise again in truth, in a new, in a, in a more clear perception, always toward a mystical truth. A, because life is cycles of death and rebirth, constant death and rebirth, which means that even death, I promise you a rebirth. I promise you. And the fact that, that the divine is set up as laws means no matter who you are, it is not based on whether or not God likes you and this idea of deserve and blame. When I hear people say... But the, those innocent people don't deserve this. Don't do, that heaven does not work like we do. It's not a judicial system in this sort of reward and punishment. It is a system of cycles and the balance of the energetics in your system, the energetics that you generate in your system through the quality of not just choices. People reduce it to the choices they make mm-hmm. to 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 this, uh, I'm a good person or I'm a bad, to polarities. They don't realize the power of their micro choices, their micro perceptions. They're getting up each day and cursing their life by saying, this isn't good enough and being a pessimist and, 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 and judging other people. All of those micro choices are actually more toxic to them, more toxic to them than, than eating cat food. And those micro choices, I, I, I believe you would agree, everything is prayer. Be careful what you wish for, but every word, every action, every everything. That is precisely why I do workshops on the power of your language. The power of your language, every word. And I've said to people, all right, I want you to give me one word. Go home and think about it tonight. When you get back tomorrow, I want you to give me one word that you're never going to use again. Just one word that you're never, ever going to use again. And everything that goes with that word is going to be extracted from your reality. So it can't be used again. All the memories that have that word are going to go. All the things that it takes, if you give me the word blue, you'll never see the ocean again and you'll never see the sky blue again. You'll see it, but not through blue, Mm -hmm. not through blue. Maybe it'll be a whiteboard all the time, but you'll never see blue again. So I just want one word, just one, maybe elephant. You'll never see an elephant again. You'll look on the, the plains of Kenya and you'll never, you'll, you'll see antelope and you'll see giraffe, but you won't see the elephants everyone else does. What word would you eliminate? None. I would not eliminate one word Mm -hmm. because I've realized that I require every single one of my words because everyone packs a punch. Yes. And every word, what I, what I have, what I have learned in my craft as a teacher is how to listen. Mm -hmm. And in one word, a person tells me more about who they are than they'll ever realize. One word, I get a person's biography because I listen to the words they use and I listen to the words they don't use. Mm -hmm. I, I listen to how they describe their crises and I listen to the words they use repeatedly. And I listened to the words they could have used, but didn't. The words they could use. And I realized that because of the vocabulary, they have 
gotten themselves into like a hamster's wheel. They don't have the vocabulary empowered enough to get them out of their health crisis yeah. or out of their mental crisis, that they cling to certain words because of the power, the magnetics of that power. And that, be, and because each word is like a prayer yeah. and that it operates laws of attraction and magnetic attraction and cause and effect that what prayer is about is about give me the grace to let go of this word. Give me the grace to let go of the power this word has over me, mm -hmm. that this word has over me. So I can, I can go near this word and it doesn't consume me, resent, blame. So I can use this word and it doesn't start controlling the way I see my life. Yeah. Failure. You know, I'm a failure. Or I want that person to fail. Or I want that person to fail in my life. Yeah. Or the inability people have to empower another person. Which is, for me, one of the greatest challenges people get to in life where they think they can empower others, but they don't. They can't bear it. They can give a blanket or a 10 bucks for food. But to actually empower another person, that is a whole nother spiritual chapter in their life. Thank you. So let's go to then that second part of that question. How often are you in prayer? Well, <clears throat> I say a rosary most every day, mm -hmm. and if not half half of that, I spend a whole lot of time um, in holy conversation. So I don't know. I mean, how do you measure that, Michael? Do I measure it by hours? I get up, and the first thing I do is a holy conversation. Um, it's, I don't know. It's so normal. It's so ordinary for me. When I dive into your book and there's, there's a process that my wife and I teach and we have a book coming out on in January and automatic writing, which is what I would call a holy conversation. You yeah. are doing that when you get up throughout the day. And my guess is that that adds a, a richness, a tenor. Actually what it's doing is you are bringing the mystic into almost every moment. Yeah, I mean, what I've realized is because every thought's a prayer, so it's it's about, like Teresa said of Avila, look for God in the small details of your life. If you tune yourself in to divine sight, to organic divinity, yes. then you, you really do see the presence of the divine in all ways. Instead of looking for great, big, huge things like winning the lotto as proof that there's God. You, ha you look for it in this small, small, tiny, everyday ways, which is like, here's, let me give you an example that happened yesterday, Michael. Thank you. I almost, I almost hit somebody driving my car. I almost hit someone. It was raining. Yeah. And, and I am as a rule, a very careful, careful driver. And I missed this man on a bicycle by inches. By, I was turning and he was crossing the street on his bike and I was turning. And I'm very alert, very careful. Michael, I missed him by, I'm going to say, two inches. That to me was divine intervention, divine intervention. And, and, and as I backed up and thought about it, when the light changed, I didn't see him, but I had hesitated because I was distracted. So I didn't start at my usual, like right as the light changed. I'd been distracted by something. So I was a little bit slow on starting the car, but I would have hit him if I had started immediately when the light changed. 
that begets the question. The term that I like to use is a setup, a cosmic setup mm. to help you even more aware that everything are cosmic mm -hmm. setups. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Precisely. And one of the, so you say, like, how often do I pray? There's many ways of prayer. And, and, and I need to constantly question myself mm -hmm. and to monitor my own responses to things, um, particularly politically, but, but in everyday life. And so I will ask myself and withdraw and say, how do I grace this moment instead of lose my power here? How do I do that? And that's where I will say, you better give me some grace. I pray exactly the way I have encouraged people to pray in this book. Give me some grace here because I'm about to lose it. And I mean, and I have to do that because I'm somebody who will in a moment, mm -hmm. you know, think something that's not supportive of the moment. I don't say it, but I will think it. And, and, and it's just, it is, I, I prefer, you know, now to practice every day what I teach, because I really do say, God, I see you in all people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard and it's hard for them to see you and me. And, and, but now is when it matters. And so just help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. So that is my constant prayer. And it's, it's, and it's every time I have, I read, I look, I see the fires in California. I see the hunger that's happening in my fellow citizens. And, and I'll tell you what breaks my heart. Why do people have to do that? Why do they have to beat up somebody or what is that? You know, and, and I know the instructions have always been to pray and I'm fascinated with apparitions, Michael. I have to say, that's the Catholic in me. Mm -hmm. And as a baby Catholic, I used to wonder, look, why don't you just come down here again and vacuum up all these awful people? Just vacuum them up and put them on another planet. You know, just vacuum them up and, and maybe put them like on another planet and they could all beat themselves up and, and then get it over with. But leave all the nice people here, you know. And... And, you know, as a, as a baby Catholic from my era, we grew up learning about the saints and about the messages from apparitions and all of that. And, and, I, and I, I have no doubt that lots of people from think all that stuff is nonsense, and I get that. But it's not. It's not. And the messages have always been consistent, which is pray pray for peace, pray for, these messages haven't been like, listen, start a store, make some money. They have always been benevolent messages on behalf of humanity, you know, pray for peace. And behind was left uh, a waters of Lourdes and, and, you know, healing substances that have to this day yeah. blessed people. And, and that's a pretty incredible stunt to pull off if you're faking it. But so these messages are, are quite extraordinary. And so now that I am into the mystical technology of prayer, now that we can merge the power of prayer with the co-creative power of consciousness, we realize that the choice to pray is the choice to make sacred the power of co-creation that the universe has bestowed upon us. That in fact, if thoughts are power, if attitudes are power, that the decision to turn that into a partnership with heaven that says, I want the highest, most holy power that I can. It is not the decision to believe, believe in off 
there is no off planet God that's going to come in and sweep in and say, okay, you guys have been bad enough. I'll save you from your own stupidity. That's why when someone says, well, I don't get it. Why was there a Holocaust? Why was there this or that? Because we didn't stop because it's up to us to use our choice and our authority to stop ourselves from our own evil. This is not heaven's issue. It's ours. You can't have co-creation and then be dependent children on an off-planet God and behind the scenes make the most malicious, judgmental, ugly choices and decide, I still need to be better than that race of people and that religion and, and et cetera, et cetera. No, you have to get, we are all one. And what I do to one person, I am doing to myself. And it will inevitably come back to destroy me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, 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 I want to go to a few key items here before we start to wind things down. But there's something you said recently in answering what, how do we get an answer to prayers? Or why doesn't the answer come? We, the, right, the answer that we're looking for. And I, I need to read this. Forgive me. It's a little bit long. You, you said... Yeah. When you ask for a prayer to be answered, when you are praying, people make this assumption, looking for the response right away or for how prayers are, 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 how prayers are answered and want it right away as if we're dealing with early things. Bear in mind at all times that the nature of heaven is mystical. It's not rational. It's not human. It doesn't operate on the day-to-day -day calendar that you do. It operates on a 360-degree view of your life. Seamless, timeless, incorporates a cosmic view and knowledge of your soul, plus all the wirings of your connections to people you have known, to people you have yet to meet, and people know, you know nothing about, and your archetypal patterns, and to events and choices that are going to kick into gear. Yeah. Does that work? <laughs> it's pretty strong. So I think what you're saying is if I pray, I win a million dollars. That ain't going to be exactly what's going to happen. But there may actually be something even better for my highest good and the highest good of all, as you said at the beginning, taking the long view or the like long game. No wealth is. Instead of winning a million dollars, the route is to teach you what real wealth is, which could be health and love and which doesn't uh, people. I cannot tell you, Michael, how astounding it is, how many people assume that means poverty as if God gives a damn what's in your bank account. As if. Heaven is like, well, if you get close to heaven, heaven's going to take your money and heaven's going to take as if you could have anything. If heaven didn't intend for you to have the, given you the creative wherewithal and arrange the coincidences in which your creativity thrives or in which, in fact, people do malicious things. And 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 they benefit from it. I mean, so you 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 have every opportunity to make cause and effect have, you know, you got to look at heaven like this. Yeah. Before you incarnate, you're given a knife and heaven says, look, I mean, here's the thing. You grab the blade and you're going to think it's a weapon and you are going to use this to harm people. But you're, if you grab the, 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 the handle, you'll realize it's a tool and you will create You'll create bowls and you'll create houses and you'll create all kinds of things. It's up to you what you do with this. I'm going to back off. I've given you intuitive instructions now. And either way, by the time you die, you are going to come back and answer for it. You will have done destruction or construction. Mm -hmm. But you're, you'll, you will have learned this tool. That's for sure. And you'll reap what you sow. It's as simple as that. How do we listen? We put that prayer out there, and you describe all of these challenges we have uh, right now, and I have to believe that the answers are there. The answers have always been there. We're not listening. Well, because you listen with your ears, you listen with greed, you listen with logic, you listen through fear. Mm -hmm. Instead of listening through, as we began our, our conversation, surrender. 
which is as, I, as you go to bed and you say, as I often say, I, this is a mess. I'm going to sleep. You figure it out. <laughs> and however it is in the morning is what I'll walk into, like St. Benedict. I, I assume that whatever I have to deal with, I have to deal with. But if you decide to tell heaven, but I don't want this to change. I don't want this to change. And I want to be able to control that person. And I want to win. When you have a list, heaven doesn't do stupid and heaven doesn't do take orders. So if you, if you pray from stupid and taking orders, giving orders, Mm -hmm. it's not, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to think, I just don't know what to do. If you're someone who says, I need proof, I need proof that if I do this, it's going to be safe. No, that's like saying, I have no faith in you, so show yourself. It's not going to happen. The whole journey of heaven is a journey of faith, which means you want me to go this way? All right, you better be there. It brings up, what does this mean to you, St. Teresa and daughter, follow me? Well, that was the beginning, you know, that was the whole, I was in the, I thought I was going to have a grand mal seizure. I mean, I thought I was having a grand mal seizure on a, a, seizure on a stage. I, I, things started, I, I started to lose my capacity to hear the audience. And then I lost it and everything went silent. I couldn't hear a thing. And I was on a, like a bar stool, which is what I traditionally teach from. And it was three feet from the edge of the stage. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have a seizure. And then I heard a whisper. Daughter, follow me. And I knew it was Teresa of Avila. I, knew, I don't know how to explain. But that's not true. It's mystical. It was what she calls intellectual knowing. I knew. I knew. And, and, and what happened was I spent the rest of the weekend teaching Teresa of Avila as if I'd been a scholar of her work. And I, I, I had only those previous few days looked at it. But I knew it. I knew it as if I'd known it all my life. And here's the thing. I was supposed to treat, teach Ignatius and John of the Cross and Rumi and Francis. And there I am teaching Teresa's interior castle as if I had been schooled in it. And I was at both watching myself, listening to myself in utter amazement, thinking, do they know that I am as amazed by this as they are? Have they any idea that I've never said this before and it's never occurred to me and it's just flowing out of my mouth and it, I cannot tell you what that was like. It was the most wondrous experience. Woo-hoo. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You talked to... Do you have any idea how much I fell in love with her that day? Do you, it... I, I, it was an ecstasy and awe. I was, I have no idea. I felt this buzz and it's never stopped. It's never stopped. Would so you, there we are. Would you call that badass grace? <laughs> badass grace. I'm telling you. It was some serious badass grace. Beautiful. Yeah. But it, it, let me add something. Yes. Because it's really important for me to say this, Michael. This badass grace is like knocking at the door of everybody. The only difference is that I delight in how it changes my life and other people are terrified. So many other people are terrified of divine intimacy. And what I've come to understand is that this is a very impersonal universe. I mean, it is operated by laws like the law of gravity. You know, you and I, all millions, anybody stands at the cliff. If we jump, none of us is flying. We're all going down. And gravity is like gravitas. It, it, it is the law of whatever 
we give our life energy to, whatever choice we make, we are giving gravitas to, we're giving our weight to. And that's what I've learned through medical intuition. Whatever we give our weight to has creative authority and we're attached to that. So we're jumping off the cliff with it. We're going to stay attached to the consequences of that. And that's just the way it is. So the laws are the laws and it doesn't change for anybody, which is why God is law. It's impersonal. The divine has no religion, has no faith, nothing. It is our task to have faith in the divine and to realize this is a system of law. Before they incarnated a half God, half man, the early beings who stood on the earth without the creation of doubt and all this nonsense understood when they heard with great clarity, I am law. I am law. This is the system. This is the order. Buddha, this is law. This is a path. Walk the path. Walk the middle way. Here's the Tao. Here's the, 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 it is law. It is law. Just keep, look at your body. You run, your heartbeat runs by law. These are the, this is where you have to stay in the mathematics. It's like Pythagoras. I did a whole workshop on the Pythagorean system and the chakras and, and mathematics, and the chakras. We are law and math and we're calculations. How many, how many, well, what our blood pressure should be. How many times our eyes should, we, we're a mathematical phenomena. All right. But. And it doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what race, what what height, what ch- da, 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 da. we're all the same. We run the same. It's all the same. But what makes it intimate is prayer. So totally impersonal and totally intimate. Wow, wow, wow. We've got to wrap things up in a minute here, but but uh, and then go to a prayer. However, the word that's coming to me is is love. Prayer and love. In fact, you say, if we invest grace and love in our lives, grace and love are returned a hundred times. Mm-hmm. Or more. Yeah, but there, but you see, that's love to me. Choice comes first. Yeah. Choice is our greatest. Because you have to choose love. And love to me is a grace. You grace that. It's a grace. It's a flow of grace. And, 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 and you, you really have to learn how to love. It doesn't flow easily. I mean, and my proof in it is that you go to therapy to learn how to love, not how to hate, Mm -hmm. but how to love that. It's so difficult that you have to be in therapy for it. That in fact, love, which is the, the, the most natural thing for us is the thing that we've made the most unnatural. The thing we're most afraid of, like truth. Mm -hmm. Telling the truth is the thing that people fear the most, and love is the thing. Love and truth. So difficult that they have to hire, people who are married, have babies together, have to go to a therapist so they could tell the truth to each other. While sleeping together, they still can't express a truth. We have an archetype, for truth telling called a whistleblower because it's so rare. And then we arrest the guy. Truth is so rare. Telling the truth, it's so common to lie. Lying is considered normal now. Mm -hmm. So telling the truth and love are rarities in that way. They're ideals to be sure. But the practice of it is very, very carefully doled out. Very, and if you don't love me, I'll turn it off. You can't turn off real love. You can't turn it off. To be sure. Okay. Big love. Big, big love. <laughs> On that note, where can people go, Carolyn, to find your beautiful book, Intimate Conversations with the Divine, to find out about your... Go to Amazon.com yep. and then go to my website, Maystep.com, M-Y-S-S, to take Phoenix, to take my Phoenix class. They could start with the first one mm-hmm. and um, or take anyone they want, but I would recommend the first one because I give an overview 
of why all these changes are happening and how the universe set the ground for this and slowly moved through the decades. And then the second Phoenix is how it works itself through our lives. And then this last Phoenix is going to be on the soul rising because the whole theme is this transformation that we are living. So it would be, or I mean, or whatever other program they would be interested in. How important is it that we, that we don't judge ourselves? Like you talked about anger being in the beginning of this process of deconstruction. How important it is it to, as you said with me before we even started this show, from a place of non-judgment, it is as it is. What do you mean? It is as it is. What are you Not to judge yourself through this process of deconstruction into the ashes and rising from it. Uh, right. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't think judgment is ever very useful, but discernment is. Discernment is. Discernment's a grace. Judgment's a handicap. You still have to be able to reflect upon yourself mm -hmm. and hold yourself accountable. And to say, I need to do this better, or why why am I thinking this way, and how do I attend break this down into pieces? Yeah. And that I am blaming another person for something that is coming from me. And so that's discernment where you say, um, I need to always bring something back home and reflect on what are my motivations? What are my choices? And you may discover I'm really coming from love. I am. And you may be surprised at really that you would say to yourself, I, I think compassion's awakening in me. Mm -hmm. I think this anxiety I feel is actually the birth of compassion. It's not ordinary anxiety and it shouldn't be medicated. And that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Thank you. So to wrap up this conversation, before we go into a prayer, any last words of wisdom on the power of prayer and grace? I, I think that, um, that if people have the old fashioned idea that prayer is Catholic or just old wrote that I think it's time that, they let that go mm -hmm. and realize that prayer is holy dialogue and that they're walking through the breath of God, that all life is God. And that all they have to do is say, I'm talking to you and don't expect to be rewarded because they're now, you know, just talk and say, I'm here. Do holy listening. Just, I'm, I, I just walk with me today. I'm on, even if you start with by saying I'm unfamiliar of how to establish a dialogue with you. And, and you may start out by thinking you're looking for an immediate response, like a good little child looking for a reward. You'll get through that. You have to get through that because that's not the way heaven works. And don't look for signs and say, don't, you have to get through that because the journey of the divine is for you to change, not to change your outside world, yeah. but to awaken your inside. Woohoo! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you mind reading a short prayer from your book? Okay, I have found a short one, and this is for um, people to remember when they go to sleep at night. It's called Healing Night Flights. Yeah. Lord, send me your healing angels tonight. Escort me out of my body and into the healing realm. Grant that they may repair my depleted soul, my weary body, and my burdened heart. May they clear the illusions from my mind and awaken me to what I need to see clearly about myself my own actions, and all that I need to repair within myself. Let me rest in the silence of the celestial realm, calm in the company of angels as they heal what I am unable to heal due to my own limitations. Let their healing graces remain in my system 
and illuminate my thoughts with insight, my heart with love, and my body with stamina, that I might continue to serve on my path. Stand guard over me while I rest, and keep company with me while I sleep, protecting me from darkness. Let me remember in the depth of slumber that I am always watched over and in your care. Shine your grace of love and healing upon those I love and all humanity, the souls I share this journey of life with each day. I surrender my soul to this nocturnal journey, knowing that I will be returned to my body before the dawn. Awesome. All my love, Carolyn, this has been so beautiful. I cannot thank you enough. My pleasure. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get intimate conversations with the divine, and begin diving into your prayer life today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this latest interview as much as I did. For more on how you can up-level your life, click on the links below for our mini masterclasses, for our boot camps, and for a very limited availability one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. Be sure to give this a huge thumbs up if you like this, leave your comments below, and you can check out more amazing videos here and here. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright.